President Farouk Hassan, your colleagues on the panel, ladies and gentlemen. It's my privilege to be here and to manage a bit of expectations as well. I hope that those who are very familiar with the due diligence um, regulations, including the German Supply Chain Act, will not be disappointed. And I also hope that those who have not had so much to do with it might also take something um, with them. To start, there is no one in this room or in this city that can really say, this is what is going to happen, this is what you have to do, and then this will happen. It is depending on the supply chains, etc. We will look at it uh, right now. Thank you so much to GCCI for the opportunity to uh, address this relevant topic. I will try to be shorter than expected to win a bit of a time. I was asked to do a 30 minute presentation. It's Thursday evening, I think we will all be happy if it's not 30 minutes. Anyways, I want to start and please, um, Wasim Zakaria is here from the Sustainability Cell at BGMEA probably a much bigger expert than I am on these topics. All is here from the uh, Danish Embassy. They have a trade uh, council that uh, provides an advisory service also for due diligence regulations. Um, Morshit is in the back, our dear colleague who has worked with us over the last 20 years. So I don't claim to be the knowledge bearer in this room, but I've tried to trigger a bit of the conversation around this topic. And I will start with something that is only marginally related to RNG textiles garment, which is the biggest sector, of course, um, that we are looking at. And it's the ship breaking industry. We all know from the ETPs that exist in washing and dyeing factories, what do we do with the sludge at the end of the process? Probably we put it in some land that is allocated for that. If we're lucky, and we have some money in our pockets, we can sell it to Geocycle, ship it to Silet, and let Lafarge Holcim burn it. But currently there is no proper facility to absorb freely hazardous waste in Bangladesh. However, there is an international convention, the Hong Kong Convention, that has been ratified by Bangladesh in June 2023 two, three months ago. This means that over the next two years, there is a period, an intermediate period, where the necessity to dispose of the waste is not imminent. So what ship breakers are doing, they are storing the sludge and the hazardous waste on their premises, and they can fulfill the expectations of the international clients by doing that. However, since Bangladesh has ratified and subscribed to this convention, in two years that has to be changed. The Ministry of Industries is preparing a project to build a TSDF, a facility that can incinerate or depose a landfill in a safe and secure way those wastes. To start this project and to implement it, it will take at least six or eight years. So we know right now that for this sector to be competitive in the international market, the Japanese are especially interested in that topic, we need to take steps. And that is true both for the private sector, that is mostly represented here, but also for the government. And GIZ, as the Development Cooperation Agency of the German government, is always in all topics trying to bring these topics together. So now, let's start this presentation. I have chosen a bit of a historic uh, entry that starts with the pride of Bangladesh to have been involved... No, one back is okay. ...in many of these trade issues over a long time, but some of that time also being exploited by other interests. Our common interest is to strengthen Bangladesh, to make it an agent in these developments. So Chandidas in the 15th century already wrote 
Chunomo Manus Pai, Shavaru Por Manus Satya, Taharu Por Enai. It's a very impressive, sensitive way to describe what we are as human beings, and that is shared between all of us. We know in 1776, 80,000 spinners and 25,000 weavers were in Dhaka and surroundings. A thriving industry. European trade companies were not willing to pay the value of one third, which was paid originally at the end of the 17th century for the textiles, the fabrics were value. And they started to send gumashtas to the production hubs to force the price reduction. Also, the British East India Company issued tax regulations that punished weavers who would produce for others. Indigo, we all know the history, is a prominent example also of how the involvement with the global supply chains can be detrimental for the people on the ground. It is our common interest that this is not the story of the 21st century and not the story of the 22nd century. Next slide, please. This is just to give an idea of what is at stake, because there is really, for all of us, we need to be aware of what is going on in order to be able to move accordingly and not only react. It is GIZ's core intention to empower, especially the public sector, because most of you are very empowered, but especially the public sector to react and be active on these uh, kind of processes. The example of the shipbreaking um, illustrates that. So what do we know about the German Supply Chain Act for sure? We know for sure that the core addressees are companies that sell in Germany or do business in Germany itself and have more than 3,000 and from next year on more than 1,500 employees in Germany itself. We also know that in Bangladesh we have a lot, in the garment industry, a lot of very transparent and data caring stakeholders. But data itself is a challenge still in many of the efforts that we are doing together with BGMEA, together with other stakeholders of the industry. And within this framework of sustainability, due diligence, etc., there is also the reality of fast fashion. Short lead times, even 12 seasons a year. That's a very high challenge to maneuver, and in parallel to be able to absorb the audits, the trainings, the expectations from everywhere. The path towards a more healthy system is being implemented at BGMA, at BKMA, also in governmental agencies, and we are trying all to make that more successful. What we can only guess is how German or European uh, authorities will really implement and look at the topics of the Supply Chain Act or the Human Rights or Environmental Due Diligence. So if anyone wants to sell you a training about how exactly it will work, you can attend it, but you cannot expect to have the super solution for your own company, because you might produce for many different brands, for many different supply chains, and their systems might be a bit different. Next slide, please. So I will briefly try to engage into the general topic of due diligence, that the German Supply Chain is act as such, then some questions that are relevant from Bangladesh and for Bangladesh, and then connected a bit with sustainability regulations. Here we see a slide that measured the mention of um, um, uh, human rights impact assessments, grievance mechanism, human rights policy, human rights training, human rights due diligence in the GRI supporting a database, and you can see that there is a clear path to more, more, more. This is a trend. From 2010 to 2020, we see that the wave is taking flow and it will not stop. In the next slide, we can also see how it's concentrating. We had, since the 1980s, a certain compliance focus. 
in the 1990s, corporate social responsibility started to produce standards and certificates, <coughs> and especially since the 2010s, international documents like the UN Guidelines on Business and Human Rights, the OECD Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises, and the ILO Declaration, Tripartite Declaration of Principles Concerning Multinational Enterprises and Social Policies, they were all referring to the same basic elements that had to be part of compliance. And now, 2020 to 2023, we see how domestic regulations in European countries, but also in others, are molding these international regulations from the 2010s into domestic legislation. So whatever we do now, it is not wise to close our eyes on that process. Because the, 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 the frequency of the modifications and new regulations, etc., will continue to increase if the politicians or the civil society that doesn't feel that things are changing. So it is wise to react, to prepare, and to anticipate what will happen. Due diligence has not been modified so much over the last 14 years, let's say, in what it means. We can still use the definitions from the UN guidelines that request companies to formulate a code, a policy, a statute, and then perform due diligence, which is a risk analysis of their interventions, ideally formulating mitigation or prevention elements, and communicating those processes. This is the same structure that is reflected in the German Supply Chain Act, and the same um, a procedure that is reflected in all drafted or already approved uh, regulations around mandatory human rights and environmental regulations. And then, of course, enable remediation and offer complaints mechanisms. And this you have seen in many different ways, probably. The loop from policy through the risk analysis, then monitoring, preventing, or remediation of risks, offer a compliance mechanism so that if something happens it can be documented and addressed, and then report, talk about it. There is the connection also with ESG, with other developments that those institutions who have, uh, uh, who are registered under uh, stock exchanges also have to fulfill already. So in the past, in the 80s and 90s, CSR was to assume responsibility after making profit. What this path of business and human rights is for, for, uh, um, looking for is to mean is, is to act before the profit arises. This is basically the shift that is intended by the international documentation but also by the domestic legislation. So in the long term, there is a strategic ambition of better social and environmental standards that we all share. And the short-term effect is how to deal with the production processes in these management systems. Okay, now let's go a bit into the German Supply Chain Act itself. Borna in Sachsen, close to Leipzig. That is where the authority that is in charge of reviewing the reports from the German companies is located. It, has, it started to um, operate only last year. And as we said earlier, the German Supply Chain Act is addressing, speaking to German companies or companies that sell or work in Germany with more than 3,000 and then later on more than 1,500 people. And they themselves have to create within their organization the reporting and transparency mechanisms to be able to fulfill the reporting requests um, published by this authority, the BAFA, in Cornwall. To engage with social and environmental risk, we know already. This is, let's say, the, the spirit of the law. The priority will always be, also from the authorities, to find a solution, to enable a way out of a certain risk, of a certain challenge, of a certain rights violation. It is not to withdraw from the production place. This is explicitly stated. So the message is, we will reward you not you as us here in this room, but you as German brand that um, has more than 3,000 people. We will reward you if you deal in a transparent manner with your challenges. If you 
address them. If you try to find a mitigation that might take one year, might take two years, might take 15 years, to be able to discuss this actively. That is also meant, sorry, one step back, please, with a duty of effort. It's not a duty of compliance, it's a duty of effort. So what the BAFA will measure, or is starting to measure, is to be able that the, that the brands document that they are making an effort in the, in the supply chain. And if there is a violation, sorry, one step back again. <laughs> if there is a violation, the reaction is, does not need to be immediately, immediately, and it has to be solved, and the money has to be shifted around. No. There needs to be a plan how to address the risk or the violation or whatever is being uh, reported. And then, eventually, BAFA will determine a penalty fee uh, to the German or international brand that is active in Germany itself. Next slide, please. Thank you. So again, the brand, the retailer and the, and the textile sector will have to fulfill the requirements and the focus of the authority will be on the risk analysis so that it's properly documented, that it starts, it tries to address the challenges that might be there. Document implementation of preventive or mitigating measures, communication and transparency, duty of effort as long as it's possible and grievance mechanisms remedies. Okay, all of you understand, of course, that, or have heard it already 500 different times. This is the abstract system that is being implemented in the supply chains in different ways. Either you fill out an Excel sheet, you have to report a data system that is uh, owned by the, by the company that you are selling to, or that you're part of. Um, the risk analysis can be done actively or through ver uh, 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 written communication. GIZ is a German company and more than 3,000 people work in Germany for GIZ. So GIZ is also reporting to the BAFA, to the authority. Of course, our supply chain is not a production process, but a service. So it's a bit easier, um, but we also fulfill all these uh, requirements. We have our codes in our contracts. We include um, the, the, the um, respect of certain rights, standards, etc., that we will assume from the people that we tender out to, and we produce a risk analysis that, uh, that um, um, is being documented and reverted. Of course, we also have agreements. Next. Yeah, we will see how the European level is going to deal with the um, Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. So far, the deep value chain is not on the focus of the uh, German Supply Chain Act. It's the connected supply chain as such that might be different from brand to brand, but the general um, intention of the law is to look at the closest and immediate um, uh, supply chain partners. And you all are aware that there are uh, some directives being developed by the European Union that are uh, not yet finalized, not yet published, and that either will make it more strict or will, um, let's say, make a coherent framework with the French and German and other legislations. Slavery and forced labor, protection of children and freedom from child labor, freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, protection against torture, fair working conditions, safety at work, rape, environmental obligations are connected to the right of health, water pollution, air pollution, excessive water consumption, excessive noise, but then also the classic international conventions regarding the use of mercury, chemicals, and hazardous waste. Again, Bangladesh is in a very good place because with the accord and with all the uh, efforts that have been made in this country, most of these topics can be addressed in a good way. Judicial liability. Many of the German brands or other companies that are active in Germany are a bit afraid of litigation. The litigation is rather soft in the German supply chain. The French loi de vigilance includes a very robust 
civil liability, but that is being interpreted in a rather, I would say, trade-friendly way. The draft EU rule, which I will not address it today, the German Supply Chain Act does not enable direct activation. The only thing that it enables is that individuals, victims, alleged victims, can address the authority and the authority will start an investigation, will address the brand and say what has happened there in your supply chain. The brand needs to document the cases and then eventually the administrative authority, the BAFA, can act. But again, not, it cannot reach to a civil liability, at least without the European Directive as of today. That doesn't mean that it's good or bad news, because as I showed initially, the trend is that the frequency of, of, the, of making it stricter will increase. So it's again good to anticipate that if the German Supply Chain does, uh, the Act does not prevent certain rights violations, probably the next regulation in a couple of years will be again more strict and will then eventually include civil liability. So just because it's not possible today, shouldn't disencourage us from doing all our best to prevent any kind of grievance. Questions for and from Bangladesh. What legitimately has been raised in different fora is, for example, why were stakeholders from Bangladesh not part of the legislative procedure when these regulations were drafted? That is a legitimate question, but in theory, the German Supply Chain Act addresses all kinds of industries, all kinds of sectors, and all kinds of countries. Neighboring countries, faraway countries, any country. So our colleague Miran Ali used to ask, yeah, what's happening with Mercedes if car parts are being produced in the United States? Yes, that can also be subject of the German Supply Chain Act. And I think some of you that are in the car industry know that both Volkswagen and Mercedes have over years US authority police sitting in their headquarters in Germany. Compliance teams that were mandated by US American courts to make the compliance units more transparent. So this is not targeting anyone. It is a reaction of the pressure from the politicians, from the civil society and from um, experts. Again, UN guiding principles, OECD guidelines, ILO um, uh, declaration, the international voluntary system did not work. The next step is now the domestic regulation and probably the follow-up step, if this doesn't work, will be stricter uh, regulation. How can we address the challenges that might come up from the different supply chains or from the different brands that we work with? Can we discuss a unified code of conduct that then can be monitored together? I think we should have the ambition to find ways to harmonize these things. However, for the individual case, nobody can be forced. So a brand cannot be forced to adjust their system that they use in many different countries just because we might come up with a very good um, um, proposal uh, for uh, Bangladesh. The burden of the reporting, the burden of bringing all the data together lies within the company that produces or sells or is active in Germany. And one way to address this challenge is to involve the local government. So together with UNDP we are trying to advocate with um, uh, various ministries in Bangladesh to 
draft or be part in the global process of drafting national action plans for implementing UN guiding principles on business and human rights. These national action plans include standards for measuring, reporting, sectorial risk analysis, etc. that can be then used for inputs towards the requirements from the supply chain. And we would also encourage, not with a certain outcome, but with a, to start a discussion or to engage deeper in the discussions on how to cross-recognize standards, to cross-recognize audits, to make eventually successful elements like the RSC for safety extended maybe to environmental topics, to look at better work and their, and, and, and their results and try to connect them, for example, with DIFI and the DOE to allow less, I would not say one, but less audits, less um, um, processes that are burdening the industry. Next slide. We all know that GRI standards have been included in the DACA Stock Exchange, for example. So companies listed in the DACA Stock Exchange have to report uh, on GRI uh, standards. We know that we already have licenses and inspections by governmental authorities. So again, robust domestic public systems might supersede even a unified codification. So it's easier if the processes are more robust then to try to find a one-way uh, solution. Again, our target together should be to make Bangladesh as a business ecosystem active and not necessarily only reactive to uh, these uh, processes. And did we miss one slide? It's a nice picture. Exactly. Made the responsible business hubs that um, Wasim Zakaria will uh, be able to discuss this uh, further, but um, next week we are trying to bring them together with other responsible business hubs that are being set up in Cambodia, in Vietnam and in Serbia, and to, to connect it with the German um, help desk for business and human rights. Um, the um, staff that is assigned to work in these responsible business hubs will be the persons that can guide companies that can guide and refer uh, to more information um, to any uh, question or detail that might be popping up and ideally broaden the, the, the conversation around these topics again without the certainty of one answer but to guide and steer and refer to um, ex previous experiences, other experiences and the content of um, the management system that we described uh, earlier. Um, what implications can we see towards civil society or workers? We do feel that the civil society and uh, unions and other um, organizations can identify and work on specific risks. The perspective of rights right holders is key for the German Supply Chain Act and will be more, maybe more relevant for the EU directive. So also from a business perspective it can be interesting to offer spaces for these conversations to allow unions, civil society but also within the factories a discussion on certain topics because if you can document that, that is a major asset for all supply chains. If you can document and relate to participation of workers in discussions, in possible solutions, that will be for sure very much appreciated by the authorities and the brands that connect with this uh, topic. And finally, I would like to just briefly, um, and similar to the, to the ship breaking uh, topic, to connect with the sustainability regulations. Okay, the grievance mechanisms, that slide we almost skipped, but you all are aware of that. We have this huge set of different uh, compliance and grievance mechanisms. 
It depends on the effectiveness of four individual cases. And also here, we think that the National Action Plan could harmonize or make it more effective instead of um, just adding more and more and more and more different paths, but to find ways to make it more effective for the um, people that are recurring to this period. But let's now go briefly to the sustainability um, topics. Thank you. Reuse, renting, repair, take back services, second hand retail, looking at material composition, chemicals of concern, payroll taxation measures for the reuse and repair sector, eco design which means color pass and tear strength, quality of zippers and seams to increase durability. All these topics are being regulated uh, uh, right now. It is a bit... a lot, right? It's a bit a lot, but it's also coming. And the companies that want to continue to engage in certain supply chains will need to find ways to maneuver. I'm sure that the brands themselves, of course, um, have many ways to anticipate and um, engage in that conversation. But it's also a burden that is coming ahead. Next one, please. Here, you can just later on um, go through the different regulations that are being prepared, that are already operational, that are being reviewed. The EU is really tightening the grip on sustainability standards related, of course, to the climate change, related, of course, also to the due diligence. Next one, next one. So again, what we can identify as easy steps, because they will be val uh, 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 valuable anyways, is to enhance transparency, enhance data, look at the use of chemicals, renewable energies, water, and waste management. This is not a magic uh, outcome of this conversation, um, but it is the core of what will happen. And finally, a brief summary, including the, right, the perspective of right holders in the reporting, in the risk analysis in the mitigation measures I think is a very low-hanging fruit that can be addressed. We need to remember that if we forget for a second the human rights and environmental, what this law is saying is mandatory due diligence. So the mandatory refers to the due diligence. To have the risk analysis, first the, the policy, the risk analysis, the mitigation, the prevention, and uh, uh, the remedies and um, the reporting, right? But it refers, the mandatory refers to the due diligence, not so much to the human rights or environmental standards, that is just the subject that uh, will be addressed. High risk supply chains, it's not targeting the textile sector, it is relevant for all supply chains that are active in, in this case, the German market. I've tried to highlight that there is a tendency towards ever stricter measures and eventually also judicial liability, so to anticipate that will be a benefit. Again, strengthening to transparency by defining and measuring more data points is key. And pre-actively identify human rights and environmental risks to be mitigated or prevented. There was a long presentation and as I said in the beginning, the expectation cannot be that we can show in a blueprint what needs to be done. It has to be a conversation, and the more active we are, the easier it will be for us to engage in the different supply chains that will require information, data, etc. Uh, from us. Thank you very much for your time, and please come back with any questions uh, via email or whatever you need, and I'm very happy to have had the chance to address you. Thank you so much.